welcome ladies and gentlemen commodity tv early in the morning here in switzerland and going directly straight to australia we want to talk with helen metals and chairman and ceo michael hudson michael good morning to australia how are you good afternoon from australia <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, Hennen Metals, your second company um, after Mawson. Oh, so you're still with Mawson, of course. Um, and you brought out some very interesting news yesterday. And I think it's a, it's a good idea to talk about and to put some stuff into context. Um, because what I saw, you just uh, released uh, some new results from boulders, um, like 10% copper with 70 grams silver, 1.5% copper like with 31 uh, grams of silver. And of course, we we both know um let's say boulder results are not making a mineralization are not making a resource by now there's much much work to be done but uh, as we always say where smoke is there is fire and i think it's a fantastic indication so maybe you can uh, shortly comment a little bit in general on that on your project and uh, what I want to know also is uh, please describe the results and put them into a context with the whole project Sure, sure. Well, you're absolutely right. This is an early stage exploration project, and 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 uh, there's no that's no excuse. This is uh, this is a brand new basinal scale discovery that literally we've just started to work on this year in uh, with with much more ferocity than we we had. We had a a low level program last year. Claims started to, were started to be granted at the end of last year. So from January to March was really our first uh, big foray. We had four geological teams and, um, and only we had to slow down, of course, because of the, the shutdown in Peru and around the world since uh, mid-March. Mm -hmm. But uh, what we found to date is um, you know, 120 kilometres of strike of this sediment-hosted copper system. We're finding results like this. We've also found lots of outcrops. In fact, we we're following up on one outcrop here, which was only a thinner zone. It was something like 80 centimetres at 8.7% copper. And, and also, you know, every time there's a, a few percent copper, there's one or two ounces of silver um, in this system. And, and then we, we followed that up in the field and found these boulders, and they're over a few kilometres of strike. So we're starting to infer that copper horizon over a few kilometres. And, and then what's exciting about that is this is part of a, a 20 kilometre part of the system in the very south that, that is now starting to stack up and where we're finding the mineralisation uh, and the continuity of certainly... There's a lot of copper there. Um, our challenge is to find the continuity at the metres to tens of metres to 100 metres of scale. And, and we're starting to see that that at, at, uh, at certainly that kilometres of scale. And then in other areas at the sort of hundreds of metre scale. That's that's the key questions to be answered. But the grade is good and, um, and the scale is good. It's stacking up. Mm -hmm, fantastic. What does it mean, like, if we put that um, in a historical context also? Can you, can you uh, give us also a bit insight historical in the project? Sure, this is a, a very unexplored part of Peru. This is uh, over the Andes into the high jungle in the, what we call the Foreland Basin side of the Andes. Uh, it's been explored extensively by the petroleum industry. They first went there in the 70s, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of work was done in the late 80s and 90s, and we've been the beneficiaries of that data. A lot of seismic work. Mm -hmm. uh, so so that, that means you, you have that data from the petroleum industry? Yeah, yeah, and it's just the first time that people like ourselves have had access to that data. It's just been made freely available to us explorers. So, so we've got, you know, we've talked about last time, source, transport, trap, the three main ingredients. Uh -huh. And then Rio Tinto, you know, the, the one of the world's if, uh, largest mining companies were there for a year doing some reconnaissance work. They drilled three holes in the very south of the project on a lead zinc part of the system. So that's the other side of the story here. We don't know about that much. Uh, and then, uh, and then they moved on um, only after a year or so. Budgets uh, got mm -hmm. cut, and they they closed their office actually, just a little bit after that. Sat dormant again for ten years. A private company had it for a year or so. Didn't do a lot. A Canadian company, and and then we've gone there with the benefit of this new information, and really extended it over this much larger area, and put it into the context in which we see now. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, fantastic. Can you tell us a little bit, and uh, I just learned that word in layman's terms, I would say that really everybody can understand it, <laughs> what the geological model is uh, and why is the opportunity so large? I mean, 120 kilometer strike length, that is, that's crazy. In, in layman's terms, uh, Jochen, uh, the, the, uh, it's big and it's high grade and it's continuous um, at the scale we've explored it so far. And our challenge is to find the continuity at uh, sort of the mineable scale. But it, this is a basin that forms the right rocks. We call them reduced facies. Uh, I'll put that into layman's terms. Basically, the rocks that suck up the copper, uh -huh. the continuity is very of that of those reduced packages and there's multiple packages so it's like a layer cake of the right rocks that suck up the copper over a very large area and um, and that's what we're finding in outcrop and boulders and and uh, and and the first literally the first people into some of these areas to ever explore these this opportunity so mm -hmm. so the scale of the target is big and and therefore the prize is big Mm -hmm. But that means, of course, you have to do a lot of more work and, of course, a lot of, uh, let's say, drilling has to be done and stuff like that. But let's say the basis by now looks fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. The risk is much higher and that's mm -hmm. why we're a lower market cap company than a mining company. Mm -hmm. uh, but the opportunity here is is large. And, and what you want in this business is not necessarily to go back into areas that have been looked at and continue to prove that something's not there. Mm -hmm. uh, you really want to look into... Well, the big opportunities are in what we call new search spaces where where we're looking for something that hasn't been looked before because then the risk is actually lower in terms of what can be found if, if people haven't started to prove it's not there in the past. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Um, let's have a look at, let's say, social behavior. Um, as this, I, I see social behavior and... Uh, yeah, let's say social um, communication um, is always important in mining and not since we are talking a lot more about ESG and stuff like that. So the point to me is you can have the best project. If you have stress with the community, if you do not get access, it's worth nothing, right? So in your terms, what's, what's going on? What are you doing? What is your social program, social licensing? Well, this is an area that hasn't been explored extensively before by the mining industry. So mm -hmm. it's an education process for the local people to tell them what we're doing, what exploration is, what mining potentially is and what we're trying to find. And, and basically building up credibility uh, with, with all different layers of society. So this comes right through the administration from the provincial district level through to landholders, through to the local police, through to the local teachers, through the local ronderos, which are the basically the local uh, police force, also um, amongst many others, we we hire people um, to to spread our uh, information and message through. Lot this is a big area, so we've we've got lots of different uh, people to deal with, yeah. and um, and for the most part, we've been welcomed, um, and and we have uh, very good support. We're very thankful for that because, like you say, if we can't get access, then then uh, it doesn't matter about the rocks and the opportunity. And, and we're doing something that hasn't been done here before and, uh, and people, you know, really haven't, haven't gone in here. So we're very uber sensitive about doing the right thing. We've got a very professional and, um, and respectful program that we've been undertaking. We've had more social licensing people out there than, than uh, geology times. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And that's always good to hear because I think this is the absolutely super base work you have to do. Um, because uh, as said, without any access, forget about it. Yeah, it does. You, you really have to, don't have to care about the project then. So you're doing the right stuff here. What is about the land use? Because as you said, you are covering such an extensive and large area. Um, do you are you working in sensitive areas? Uh, do you have, let's say, a problem with natural preservation? How does that work? And, and uh, probably, let's say, do you have a lot of indigenous people there or is it uh, for you easy to deal with? Yeah, it, that's a very good question. No, no, and, and no, basically. <laughs> like is it. The, is, is the answer. Uh, so we, we are... We are dealing in areas that all the granted claims are outside protected areas, N nothing. We've got 87 claims. Three of them are overlapped by some sort of protection area. We've got a municipal protection area over a couple of claims. 
Um, but that's three out of 87, and they won't be granted it if uh, if those claims can't be explored. So, so literally, um, 98% of the area is outside, and all the granted claims are 100% outside. And we've got no interest in working in those areas. We've avoided them. Um, in terms of indigenous areas, it's um, it's it's a process that takes a lot longer if you are near or within indigenous areas in Peru, and and we've. We've uh, only got, I think, 5% of our area is within Indigenous areas because, once again, that's time and um, and we really just don't want to go down that process. We want to keep it as simple as possible. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Um, last question. What is the financial situation of the company today? What does it look like? How many shares do you have outstanding? And, of course, important uh, for me as an investor, um, what is management share in the company? Yeah, so we've got um, a, around 78 million shares, I think, outstanding. Management and insiders have about 16% of that. So mm -hmm. we're, we're very heavily invested. Uh, and the cash position is, uh, when I last looked at the bank account a few days ago, 1.6 something million Canadian. Mm -hmm. uh, we hope to get back in the field uh, when, when we're able to, of course, and it's safe to do so. And that looks like It will be late June through to July at the moment, but it's a very fluid situation. Mm -hmm. uh, expiration is part of the Peru government's uh, mandate. They've got a four-stage process, and, and um, when we get to the third stage, that's when expiration with specific rules and regulations will be permitted to start again. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. If you can go back to the field, what would be like the, the next immediate work you want to do? Uh, lots of boots on the ground, basically. So we've got our field team ready. Uh, this this time over the last few months where we haven't been working, we've done a, a, a lot of remote work, literally remote work with uh, satellite yeah. imagery, and that's pulled a lot of things together because we've been able to mix that with our observations in the field. And, and uh, we're actually still waiting on quite a lot of assays from the field program because uh, samples are getting held up. They're, they're literally sitting in our field shed in the in uh, in uh, the project area and we can't get them back to Lima at the moment. So so it will be lots of very good geology really to, mm -hmm. to continue to prove or disprove the model and, and um, so far, so good. Fantastic, great. My really last question is, uh, I read your names like uh, Quinton Henning, for example. Uh, can you maybe give us two, three sentences on the team? Because my feeling is that you have some top-notch professionals assembled, like yourself, of course, also. <laughs> no, well, a measure of a person, I think, is the people they have around them yeah. and the depth and quality and honorability of those people. And and um, and I'm very fortunate to have all those characteristics in, in many, many of the people around me that uh, include Quinton. As you said, Quinton is a very famous mm -hmm. uh, North American geologist. He's been associated with lots of discoveries. Mm -hmm. He's made investors lots of money through those yeah. discoveries. He, he runs or is chairman of Novo Resources and and Irving resources at the moment would be two of many things that he's involved with. But he came to us and said, you know, I see what the guys are doing up in Ecuador um, and a lot of uh, mineralization discovered there. You seem to be putting into a context with all this seismic data. I'd uh, be very interested to be involved with you guys. And we talked and and he came out to site in February. Um, just we went, went there together and he saw the opportunity. And, and uh, so he's now helping advise. Mm -hmm. um, we have uh, Kira Talbot, who's a VP exploration for Lundin um, on, on the board of directors. Georgina Carnegie, who's ex-World Bank OECD on the board of directors. Um, some very good geologists, uh, David Henstridge, who's been a, a, a long-term associate of mine on the board. Nick DeMere, who keeps the project mm -hmm. running. So, that, And then the technical team I haven't even started to talk about, which yep. uh, is Les <laughs> Lars and, and a good team. So it's, it's uh, yeah, you, you don't want... Actually, the most efficient teams, I think, are at this scale. And this is the scale of people that generally make discoveries, right? It's, mm -hmm. a, it's This is the, the dynamic, quick, fast-moving mm -hmm. uh, team that you really want uh, in, an, in an exploration business. Absolutely. Fantastic. Well, Michael, thank you very much. That looks all very promising. Uh, we keep fingers crossed that you really can uh, access very fast, uh, again, your project in Peru. And uh, then I would say keep us posted uh, with some more good news. 
Absolutely. Thanks again. <laughs> Super. Thank you very much. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, that was Michael Hudson, the chairman and CEO of Hannon Metals. And you heard it, of course, it's grassroots exploration. It's an early stage project, but uh, very promising boulder samples already. And of course, uh, they were also held back by COVID-19, but they had the, at least the luck and the chance to do a lot of remote work, like satellite imaging and putting a lot of data together. What I really like with the project is that they also have the data from the uh, former oil exploration and or the uh, 2d seismic and stuff like that uh, which uh, yeah helps a lot saves a lot of time and saves a lot of money and i also like the team really because this those uh, is an yeah uh, a, a cooperation assemblation of top-notch experts out of the mining um mining universe and uh, with a proven track record and i have a quite a good feeling that this company is going to make its way and uh, I, I would say we keep you posted you should check out the company thanks for watching us and bye-bye from Switzerland and also bye-bye to you, Michael. Thank you very much to Australia and have a great evening. Thanks, Jochen. Thank you. Bye-bye.